So let's begin. Daily Power Parsha explores the reading of the day ish, sometimes a day off, a day before, a day later. Today, we're going to finish up our conversation from yesterday and launch into some new territory. So let's uh, let's kind of refresh refresh the uh, the screen, so to speak, or refresh our memories. Um, in yesterday's reading, let me pull it up here so we can all be on the same page here. Yesterday was reading number four, and it talked... Um, We talked about the warning about plague number 10, the, the death of the firstborn. We also spoke about the commandment, the mitzvah regarding Rosh Chodesh, which we said and we clarified last night at the Torah studies class really is comprised of two elements. Number one, Rosh Chodesh itself, that Rosh Chodesh is the, what that the Jewish calendar goes by the moon and by the renewal of the moon and that sort of thing. So that's it's one message. The next piece of that message was that the month of Nisan will be henceforth in Torah considered to be the first, the first month, even though the calendar year is changed on Rosh Hashanah, which is in month number seven. Nonetheless, Nisan is the first month. And then we had the commandment regarding the Paschal Lamb. So I want to speak to you about a few themes, one about Rosh Chodesh and one about the Paschal Lamb, and go a little bit deeper into our conversation. The difference between Tishrei and Nisan, the two Jewish months, Tishrei being Rosh Hashanah and Nisan being Passover, the difference is the difference between creation and redemption. Tishrei, the first day of Tishrei is Rosh Hashanah, which is the anniversary of the day that the world was, or the world slash Adam, Adam and Eve were created. So it's the genesis of existence it's the beginning of creation it's the beginning of this okay what happens in the month of nisan it's the rosh hashanah if you will it's not called Hashanah, but it's like the month of redemption liberation freedom or more precisely the difference is nature versus supernatural so the the this, the origin of nature, right? The nature, the structure, the matrix, if you will, of the universe, the origin of that, or the, the month that highlights that is Tishra, Rosh Hashanah. That's when the world was created. That's when nature emerges. What about the supernatural? Miracles, transcendence, light, not vessel, but light. That's the month of Nisan. And in truth, in our lives, we need both. We need to operate by the rules of nature, which just on a very simple basis, we have to work to earn money and we have to, you know, we plan to eat for plant. <laughs> if you're a farmer, right? You plant to, so the food should grow and you have to, you have to work within the, the norms and the rules of nature, typically. But there's also a time and a place to go out a little bit beyond the structure, to go beyond the rules of nature, to extend and to reach out beyond the limitations of time and space. Every time we pray, we're connecting with something greater than time and space. Every mitzvah that we do connects with us with something greater than time and space. Every time we study Torah, every day DPP and, and other times that we have, we transcend the limitations of time and space and connect with the author of Torah, who, of course, transcends those limitations. And thus, we give ourselves moments of transcendence, moments of release from the typical boundaries and strictures of nature. This is what Moses essentially was telling Pharaoh. Let my people go. God says, let my people go so that they may serve me. The implication being when we serve God, like we spoke about a few days ago, when we serve God, when we connect with the ultimate source, then we are leaving Egypt. We're freeing ourselves from those boundaries. So in essence, we have two modalities. There's life in its normative, limited state. And then there's life in its transcendent, holy state. And we need both. 
Both are valid months. Both are valid modalities. Tishrei is valid. Nisan is valid. You need moments of order and moments of transcending order. You need times in which you're working the system and times in which you bypass the system. Times in which you work and send emails and make phone calls. And times that you times in which you plug into a divine reality that is totally beyond all of that other stuff. We need both. You need both. I need both. A human being, a healthy human being has both months operational. A Tishrei modality and a Nisan modality. A creation modality, a redemption modality. A nature modality, a supernatural modality. The question though is, which is first? That's the question, which is number one. And that's what the Torah is telling us. Not just we need to know about the month of Nisan, but God says to Moses, before the Exodus, you need to know that this month is number one. Yes, when you count your calendar year, when you turn the page of your calendar, right? A year is a natural cycle based on the moon or the, or the, or the sun or both, right? Because Jewish calendar actually reconciles both. So the year, is a natural cycle following the rules of nature. And thus, a year is the year is going to turn over Tishrei. It's going to align itself with a Tishrei modality because it is part of nature. That's not your first month. Oh, that's the first month. That's the first calendar month, but that's not your first month. There's a difference. 5782 begins the first of Tishrei. 5783, sorry, 5782 began this past first day of Tishrei. 5783 is going to happen. The next Jewish year is going to happen the next time we come around to the month of Tishrei, the first of Tishrei. 100% every day of the week, every year, that's going to happen. That's not what God is telling Moses. What God is telling Moses is this month of Nisan is to you, that's what it says, to you, HaChodesh Zalachem, Rosh Chodeshim. This month is for you, the first of the months of the year. And that means something completely different. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a cog in a machine? Do you see yourself as a pawn in this, you know, this whatever game that others are playing? Do you see yourself as a limited creature in a limited finite reality doing limited things? Or do you see yourself as a piece of God, and thus someone who is invinci invincible and unlimited and unbreakable and transcendent and infinite and eternal. I would propose the latter would be a healthy Jewish way of looking at things. And that is what it means that this month, Nisan, is your first month. Yes, the, the, years, the, the year begins, sure, the year begins in Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah. But when do you begin? What's your number one? What's your, what's, what's the thing for you? What's your number one? Nisan. And that reminds us, I mean, this is, I mean, if we're being just very uh, obvious, we would say, this is our story as a, as a collective, not, not, not only individually, but as a collective, as a people, this is our story. We are not here, I'm talking about Jewish survival despite all the odds, right? Jewish survival is not a natural phenomenon. It's not like, oh yeah, it makes sense. Jews are still here. You kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? First of all, what civilization is still around 3000 years later, let alone a civilization? How many have come and gone due to any number of things, let alone a civilization, a people, a, a faith, a tradition that has been literally hunted and targeted like none other on earth? Throughout time, throughout space, when I say space, I don't mean outer space. I mean, throughout lands, throughout time, different eras, different places, Jews have been hunted. How is it possible that we've survived? And the answer is because we are not a people that's limited to the rules of nature. If we were, we would be gone. The Talmud says, this is not even a mystical thing. The Talmud says, the Jewish people are like a sheep among 70 wolves. By nature, that sheep does not have a chance to survive. The only reason the sheep survives is because of the shepherd 
that's taking, that's protecting the sheep. That's what we would call supernatural protection, divine protection, divine intervention, whatever you want to call it. But it's a miracle. Our story is a miracle. Just like it was a miracle that the Jews survived and escaped from Egypt, our continued story as a people is likewise no less of a miracle. In fact, I would say it's a bigger miracle. The fact that Jews and Judaism is vibrant today, a mere seven decades after the Holocaust and the extermination of six million, not, okay, I don't want to rank Jews here, but six million of among our best and brightest. Europe was then the, the, the place of Judaism. America had a very small Jewish community. Israel had a very small Jewish community, right? The center of, of global Jewry was in Europe. And that that should be, there should be a decimation on such a level. And the fact that 70 years later, Judaism is so vibrant, despite all the challenges, we know the challenge, we don't have to speak about the challenges, but Judaism is vibrant beyond anyone's wildest expectations. It's nothing short of a miracle of our times. We can choose not to see it. We can choose to like, pay attention to the upcoming Georgia-Alabama game and not pay attention. And we should maybe also think about the Georgia-Alabama game for many other reasons. But I mean, we, ha we would have to be just dishonest not to call that a miracle. So here's my point, very simple. God tells Moses, the month of Nisan is month number one. And everyone has a problem with that. Month number one, how could month number one not be Rosh Hashanah? How could, the, how could you have a calendar that begins with month seven, not, something here doesn't make sense. And the answer is because we're thinking in very limited terms because there's two different realities. There's a nature reality and then there's a supernatural reality. There's in the box and out of the box. In the box, sure, tish, call Tishrei number one, no problem. I mean, I mean, don't call Tishrei number one for the reason that we're about to say, but Tishrei begins the box. Sure, so in the box, Tishrei is at the head of that, Rosh Hashanah. But who said to who told you to live inside the box? Who told you to live inside the box? That's what God is telling Moses. Who told you that you're limited by nature? Who told you that? Who told you to be in the box? Right. I created a box, but I never told you to go inside the box. That's what God is telling Moses. Don't don't volunteer to climb in the box. That's not your number one. Your number one is infinite. Don't limit yourself by the box. Don't climb in and close the lid on top of yourself and say, here I am. How's it going? Like, wh why do that? Why limit yourself? You are an infinite being. Why would you impose limitations on yourself? How many times do we not do something because we told ourselves we can't do it? Isn't that always? Isn't that always what it is? Isn't it really, really, for really being honest, that our limitations are mostly primarily comprised of us telling ourselves we can't do it. And if that's the case, we just have to remember what God tells Moses. Nisan is your number one month. That's your, that's your starting point. Your starting point is big, transcendent, supernatural, miraculous. Don't limit yourself to nature. Don't write the rules for yourself. Why do that? Why limit yourself? You know why so often? One second. I heard an amazing idea. There's a discussion, a conversation. You know, I, and, and I, I was mentioning before about it's nice to see the community back. And I didn't only mean in person. I didn't only mean in person. What I meant was it's nice to see the big organizations, big whatever, the organization, the city-wide organizations, like getting back to to do to, to activity. You may know this. I mean, you probably know this from, from us. We didn't shut down in the pandemic. We didn't shut down. Whatever way possible, more active than ever. And you should know it's not just us although I think we have a unique uh, position, but Chabad's around the world have been active. When other organizations were shutting down, Chabad has been globally, and Chabad every place is locally run by the rabbi and the rebbitzin, but in general, Chabad has been super active by, you know, whether it's, you know, purchasing, building buildings and purchasing land. I mean, just on every level, Chabad has been booming. 
So there's a recent conversation, I don't remember between who, recent conversation that somebody posted about. Somebody was wondering, you know, how is it that these young Chabad guys go out there into a community, you know, 20, 30 years old, and they're buying, you know, $10 million building projects. Like, like how, 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 how do they do that? And somebody responded because no one ever told them that they couldn't. Because no one ever told them that they couldn't. Yeah. They went to yeshiva. They don't know anything about buildings. They come out into the community. We need a building. That's it. We're putting up a building. No one ever told them. There's a, there's a beauty in not having the narrative of I can't. Because the narrative of I can't is the most destructive. Because it's the one that you and I, you and I actually believe. That's the problem. It's the one that we believe. When I we have to about, add to that. Yeah, I have please. to add to that. It's also Chabad, in my experience, all the years I've known you, participated or not participated, when I lived in New York, wherever I've been, you go to the people. Right. You don't, you might buy a building, but if the people move, you're going to buy a building where they are. Right. The rebel was about street Judaism. Just hit, are you Jewish? Would you like to do a mitzvah? Let's go. You're right. You're right. You're right. It's meeting people where they are. And it comes down to a mindset of, but that's, you know what? That also speaks to this because the mindset of, okay, we're here and we're waiting. That's also in a box, right? That's also in, in, a, in a sort of box and a limitation. We exist in this framework. If it doesn't fit, then I guess, you know, it's, it's not going to work. Whereas when you're just, you know, you're not, you're not limited by a box. So then wherever you are, you're coming out from work for lunch. Boom. I got it. I got a, I got a, mitzvah tank you know what that is like an rv with that yeah ready to go i got some books got some candles to light i got some uh shabbat candles that you can light on friday nights some film to wrap some kosher food to make a blessing on ready to go it's a completely different mindset completely different mindset but you know i don't want to make this too much about chabad it, it's really about all of us it's about all of us not being our own pharaohs to put it bluntly don't be your own pharaoh. Don't be the one that tells yourself, no, you can't go. Give no. yourself permission. Give yourself permission to be, to, to, to do something amazing that you might otherwise be tempted to tell yourself no. That's the idea here. So Nissan is month number one because that's what we're about. Yeah. But is, is Nissan month number one symbolic for Moses? And the Exodus, how does it relate tangibly for us today? And is there any tangible yeah. celebration or mitzvah or? It's a good question. It, the, the most practical application of this conversation, of, of God and Moses' conversation, is that the, w- throughout the five books of Moses, when God is referring to the holidays and their months, Nisan is month one and Tishrei is month seven. On our calendars, no, our calendars begin with Tishrei. So if you're counting, I mean, I don't think they're numbered, but if you're counting from the top of the calendar, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It goes from Tishrei and then that way. But are months counted? Are they listed with a count? Otherwise, not really. So it doesn't really have much of a practical impact because the calendar, the, the year still begins from Tishrei, the new number a year. The message really, therefore, is symbolic. The message is therefore primarily symbolic. That don't align yourself with nature. Don't, don't, don't write a box for yourself. And that's and, because he's getting. God knows that soon the commandments will be given. So yeah, well, the, think about it. There's a there's a literal exodus happening, which is literally getting out of under Pharaoh's thumb. Then we're gonna get the Torah soon, which is like gonna be liberating even though it's giving us a to do a big to-do list but it's liberating because taking us out of our own limitations and giving us a divine perspective so yeah in other words this is about to get you're you're about to get you're about to start operating on a completely different level so this is kind of like the precursor to that like get ready to the first month of your new spiritual life exactly exactly perfect okay good so now oh that was that now the next thing that I want to mention, there were two mitzvahs, Rosh Chodesh and the Paschal Lamb. I want to mention an insight on the Paschal Lamb that is pretty much the same idea, but just in a different context. You'll see what I mean. 
So the Paschal Lamb, God suddenly is very concerned about how the meal is prepared. If you recall yesterday, God says, you got to roast it over fire, no pan, no pan cooking, no sauteing, no, who cares? God is such a micromanager. Imagine you go to a restaurant and you're like, okay, here's what I want. I want a lamb, but roasted over an open fire, right? Like I want it, you get what you get. Like what? Like what's the, what, what if, what if, um, what if somebody likes it, um, I don't know, cooked, pan seared? No, it has to be directly over fire. Why? Seems very, very bizarre that God is getting involved in how the Paschal lamb is cooked. Take the lamb, cook it however, and enjoy it. It also seems, Rabbi, that, you know, we didn't have time. That's the, the theory to have the bread leaven, right? But how come there's time to do all these elaborate things with the... Well, remember, they had time to prepare for this meal because they got the mitzvah on the first of the month. And this was day 15. They had two weeks to prepare. Oh, okay. Um, they only were rushing after midnight. That was the second batch of matzah, which we spoke about, but whatever, that's another topic. But they had, they had theoretically time to get everything ready, to get the rub ready, you know, to get, to get all the ingredients ready, to get the fire stoked, to get the wood. But it's interesting because we don't find this by any other sacrifice. When it comes to the sacrifices, remember, um, and Leviticus talks about this a lot, but if you recall from our discussions then, there are many sacrifices that the Kohen was allowed to eat, that the person bringing the offering was allowed to eat, called the Shlamim, the peace offering. We don't find in Torah that the Torah says, oh, when you eat of this sacrifice, you have to cook it this way or that way. Eat it. Enjoy it. There's no God is not micromanaging, but here he does. Why? So I want to share with you an insight that I once heard. There's two primary ways to cook. One is with water, one is with fire. Now, you might say, well, you always have to cook with fire, even with water, and that's true. But essentially, when it comes to cooking with water, what it means is that you're heating up the water, but you're cooking the item in hot water. So think about a, um, think about a brisket. I got a killer recipe for brisket, by the way. Okay, I feel like the class should just move onto the brisket recipe. We should, we should, we should move the I class. I haven't brisket. tasted your kugel. <laughs> Potato. I, oh, by the way, the plan is for the Shabbat dinner. I plan on making my kugel. So that's okay. Yes. That's that, your gift to us. That, on your may, that may be another reason to come the 28th of January, but I'll let you decide your favorite reason. That's now, a selling point. That is a selling point. Okay, so we'll have to maybe put that out in, in future correspondences or upcoming correspondences. So here's the deal. Um, my brisket recipe involves... A cast iron pan, you put like, you put a rub on the brisket, you coat it, and then you pan, you, you sear that thing. You take a piece of meat and you, you slap it on the pan and it's like, you get it charred almost. Then at the same time, then you put that into a, into a foil pan, foil tray, whatever it is, and then you... You mix together some items, including beer and onions and little, um, what else do we put in there? Um, I feel like there's apricot preserves or something. Whatever, I forget already the details of the recipe. I have it written down. And then you pour that over it and then you cook it for a few hours. Here's what I want to say. That brisket, which comes out phenomenal, is not at all roasted over an open fire. It's not. The first time it's seared, it's inside a pan. You know what that means? Cast iron pan. You know what that means? That means that as it's cooking on the fire and the cast iron on the fire, there's still a layer of liquid because the meat lets go of liquid and it's still cooking in that. You put a little oil on there. It's still cooking on the oil. It's not over the fire directly. And then I put it into a pan and then pour a thing over it with liquid and then it again cooks in liquid. So that's cooking with liquid. Is there any tomato? tomato? <laughs> no. no. Cooking with fire, not this recipe. Cooking with fire means, and, and what I'm talking about is directly over fire. So you have two, two, two types. Water and fire. What's the difference? <coughs> water. <coughs> sorry, I'm getting too excited. Water by nature is very settled. 
water is settled. What do I mean by settled? You pour water into a cup. What? Oh, yeah, I, have, I have some tea in this cup. Can you see it without me pouring it? Yeah, there's tea. This is a green tea with a little bit of mango in it. That's what they say. That's what they say. So you pour something into the cup. And what, is the, what does the liquid do? It settles in. Settles in. It gets comfy. Um, if you make a hole in the bottom of the cup, it'll uh, get even comfier by going down to the next lower spot. Water is always settled. It's always going low. And it's like, you know, when you settle into a comfortable chair, it means that you kind of sink into it. Water is sinking and getting comfortable. What is fire? Fire is anything but comfortable. You ever see fire? Fire is the most restless thing out there. Fire is like, oh, fire is like moving and shaking, right? Fire is, is totally unsettled. Fire, it's like, it's jumping, it's flickering, it's smoking, it's, it's all sorts of things. It's not settled. Fire rises up and water comes down. Water is settled and fire is unsettled. Fire is, there's a good word for this. Fire is striving and water is contentment. There we go. Let's do this. Let's use these two words. Water is contentment and fire is striving. God says to Moses that you're about to leave Egypt. And that experience is all about striving. Being in Egypt means that you're comfortable, you're settled, you're a slave. Remember, it's not about Pharaoh. It's about Pharaoh. It's not about external Pharaoh. It's about internal Pharaoh. The internal Pharaoh says, you're good, you're fine, settle down, sit back, relax. There's nothing else to accomplish. Stay inside the box. It's the same theme I said in different language. I said I told you before it's going to be the same thing. Just different, different way, different angle on this. The water says, stay where you are. You're good. And fire says, there's more to accomplish. Fire wants to undo itself. It wants to go back to its source. It always, the flame flickers up. You turn a candle, the flame still goes up. It doesn't go out. Fire is always striving. And God says, you know what the message is? We need to strive. The message here is we need to strive because striving equals freedom. Striving equals liberation. Striving equals exodus. You cannot be free unless you are striving. If you're, if you're not striving, if you're content, then you're not free. You're stuck within your own parameters. And they might, they might be holy parameters. They might be holy parameters. There's limitations of holiness also. It's still a limitation. You could be a slave in a holy space. And you know what that means? I'll be very, very specific. Every single day you're davening. You pray every day, but it's the same thing, same experience, the same by rote, paint by numbers, in a box, same stuff. Not, I'm not knocking it. I mean, I kind of am, but not, not in a way of, of, of saying it's bad. It's not bad. It's good, but it's not freedom. It's still holy limitation. This is called, it's, it's, it's called in, in, the, in the language of Torah, it's in language of Chassidus. The This constitutes a limitation in the realm of holiness. Yes, there can be such a thing. What is the true definition of freedom? It means breaking out. And going higher. The author of writes in Tanya. The, back, the Talmud says that when you study, when you review your studies 100 times, you're not serving God. When you review your study 101 times, you are serving God. Alter Rebbe says, what's going on? 100 times, you're not serving God. 101, you are? What? He explains. Because back in the day, this is before the oral Torah was written. Before the Mishnah, before the Talmud, before the Medrash, before any of this was written. So everyone had to commit everything to memory. How do you remember the whole Torah? You had to study it a hundred times. That was the norm. The, the protocol was, if you were a Torah scholar, you studied everything 100 times. You know, um, somebody wrote a book about how many hours you need to become an expert in something. You know what I'm talking about? Somebody wrote a book about 10,000 hours or something. You become an expert in something. He researched it. I'm not saying it's true or not true. I'm just saying, you know, so they, they had a number 100 times. So the author of it says, yeah, that's, if you do 100 times, that's, that was the norm and that was comfortable. But if you do it 101 times, even though it's only one more time, 
It means that you're breaking out of what's comfortable. And it means you're, you're, you're extending your muscle beyond what is normal. And that is as valuable as the other 100 times put together. And in fact, even more valuable because 100 still means that you're stuck in the box. 101 means you're out of the box until that becomes the box. And then I guess you got to go to 102. But okay, I, we'll, we'll take it easy on you for right now, but start with 101 and, and we'll see how long it takes for that to be the comfort. That's the point. That's the big idea. The big idea here is that God says, there's no room for water in my, in my Exodus meal. You, you want to have your Exodus meal? It's got to be fire. No, water is your complacent, your content. What's contentment? It's fine. It's comfortable in Egypt. Yeah. Okay. So we have to build some buildings. All right. It's still comfortable. We know what we got. No, that's not. Come on. You don't want to be a slave. You don't want to be stuck in yourself. You got to be restless. So Passover, the Exodus is really a celebration of restlessness and the striving and the yearning. It's the same theme, just different languages. We'll get to the same point. So both mitzvahs remind us of the same theme, and they are both prerequisites to the Exodus. God is telling Moses, you really want to be free? You really want to be liberated? You really want to be Exodus? Great. This is your first month, Nisan, and this is how you cook your food directly with fire, right? Conceptually, that's the message. All right. I feel like we did that. We Hopefully, we got that. You got that. I got that. And we can uh, we can move a into quick the new question, Just quick. So sure. Pesach, does it mean Paschal and Passover? I mean, the, in Hebrew. So Pesach means to jump over. To jump over. Yeah. So it's called Pesach, uh, like Passover, like uh, jump over Passover. So Pesach is Passover. So that's the holiday. And it's the carbon Pesach is the Paschal, the Pesach, the Passover offering. Pascal, oh, so Pascal, Pesach doesn't mean Paschal. I don't know. What Pas the truth is, uh, to be honest, I don't know what Paschal means. Oh, I don't know. Paschal am, yeah. But I don't know what the word Paschal means. Oh. So I just don't know what P-S-P-A-S-C-H-A-L. Well, I thought you said yesterday that Pesach. I called it a Paschal lamb. I, I'm sure I yeah. called it a Paschal because that's what everyone calls it. But we could call it a Passover lamb. I mean, okay. uh, Paschal, I'm assuming, is the English term for Passover-ish. That's what I think. But I don't know for sure. Pesach, Paschal? Maybe. Paschal, I just searched. It has. It kind of has a meaning of Easter. I don't know. If that's what it. Uh, no, yeah. that's no. That's that's a that's a twist. That's okay. a new twist and an old favorite. Okay. That's looking at it through a different through a different perspective. Right. And right. That's um, what we would call um, projecting. Yeah. That's projecting. There's uh, there's definitely an origin that's beyond. Right. It started before that. It started before Easter. So it's got to have a meaning outside. But honestly, these are English words. It doesn't actually make a difference. Right. Pesach is the Hebrew. Passover is the, the translation. I'm assuming Paschal is the transliteration, but skewed a little bit. That's my assumption. But I'm, I'm happy to be wrong on that and happy to say I don't know because I don't actually know. All right. Let's jump back in or jump in to the new reading. This what's happening with my screen? Oh, my screen is all wonky from last night. Okay. A second. Let me reorganize my stuff. Can you guys see this? Is it coming up clear by you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Reading five. It's a short reading. Um, I was so excited about sharing these ideas. I hope that came through. I'm still excited having shared those ideas. I love those insights, but now four, for now five for Thursday. Okay. Um, so, uh, is it smaller than usual, bigger than usual? I don't know why I'm being thrown off here. No, it's the same. Fine. Same. Okay, good. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. So, after all of the um, information that God tells Moses, After all the information that God tells Moses about what the plague is going to look like and what you need to do before the plague and, and tell the people this and tell them that and about Rosh Chodesh and about the, the Paschal Lamb. So now Moses conveys the message to the Israelites. So here we go. Uh, Moses summoned all the elders of Israel. That's the go-to. If you, I mean, I'm sure you've noticed this, that Moses doesn't gather everybody. He gathers the leaders, and then they tell 
everyone else. So Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, draw forth or buy for yourselves. Either you have or you need to purchase sheep for your families and slaughter the Passover sacrifice. So he told them in advance. Remember, they were supposed to take the animal, already have it ready to go on the 10th of Nisan, and they would only bring it on the 14th in the afternoon, getting ready for the night of the 15th. So they had, and this, and God told Moses on Rosh Chodesh. So I'm assuming that Moses told the Jewish people, the Israelites, the elders, on the same day, or maybe the next day. So it's got to be like the first or second day of Nisan, and they still have like nine or 10 days to get, to purchase a sheep, sheep.com. All right, so um, yeah, and you shall take some more details. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and immerse it in the blood that is in the basin. So when you slaughter the animal, collect the blood in a basin in a bowl, then take hyssop, which is uh, like an herb plant thing, dip it into the blood in the basin, and you shall extend to the li- sorry to the lintel and to the two doorposts the blood that is in the basin. So you Painting, remember, God said to Moses, now Moses is telling the people, you got to paint the doorposts and the lintel, top and sides, uh, with the blood. And you shall not go out. That's very important also. You shall not go out. No one should venture outside. Angel of death is everywhere. Don't go outside. Quarantine. Any man from the entrance of his house, no one should go out from the entrance of his house until morning. So that whole night of the, of the plague, no venturing outside. Death will be everywhere. The Lord will pass, not over, but pass to smite the Egyptians. Pass means pass through to smite the Egyptians. And he will see the blood on the lintel and and on the two doorposts. And the Lord will, oh, I'm so glad we have this, pass over the entrance. Ooh, Pesach, right there. Pesach, Pesach, Passover. That's the literal meaning of Pesach. Pesach is Passover. And the Lord, that's, that's literally the word right there. Ooh, the U in the beginning is and. That's a prefix. U and Pasach, and he will pass over. And the Lord will pass over the entrance of your home, seeing the blood, etc. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house to smite you. Destroy, meaning the angel of death. God will make sure that that passes by or over your houses. And says Moses to the elders, to the people, and you shall keep this matter as a statute. That means as a, as a chok as a law, as a mitzvah, for you and for your children forever. That's a big word. You see this? This was not meant to be a one-time ritual. The Paschal lamb and, the, and, the, and, the, and eating the thing. This is meant to be an annual, a perennial, yeah? An annual every year, every year. And it was, by the way, as long as we had a temple, they had a Paschal lamb. Now we don't have a temple. That's what we put on our Seder plates. We have the shank bone. You know, one of the items is a shank bone. We don't have a temple, so we can't bring a sacrifice. We don't even want to pretend to bring a sacrifice because we don't, we don't, and we discussed this before, we don't try to replicate any of that. We don't have a temple, we don't have a temple. Like we're waiting for Mashiach and a temple and all that stuff. So as long as we don't have that, so the closest we get is we symbolize it with uh, with the bone of an animal or chicken, chicken neck, it's Chabad's custom, even less of a direct uh, representation. Be that as it may. Um, but the, verse 24 is big. That means that the mitzvah is supposed to be done for all time at, or at lo, as long as you can do it and then you symbolize it. And it shall come to pass, here we go. It shall come to pass when you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he spoke that you shall observe the service. So do this when you enter the land of Israel. So when, when Moses tells the people you should do this forever, he clarifies when does the mitzvah kick in? When you enter the land. So this is why when the Jews were wandering in the desert for 40 years, they were not obligated to bring the Paschal lamb. Are you with me what I'm saying? The Paschal lamb forever observance really only kicks in once they're in Israel. So they did it in Egypt, and then they did it in Israel, and then and as long as there was a temple. They did it once in the desert. On the first anniversary, they did it once. Not because they had to, because they wanted to. The first anniversary of the Exodus, they uh, they roasted some lamb. They brought the offering. But after that, the other 39 years, they didn't do it. All right, let's, let's go. Let's keep on going. Now Moses gets nostalgic. I got nostalgic today. I got nostalgic. I have my photos in Google Photos. You know what that means? Like Google has a service where they, um, 
I mean, it, I'm sure it helps them somehow, but they automatically like back up or store your photos and you don't have to have them, let's say on your phone, you could just, they're in the cloud and you can always download them, but they're also somewhere that you can easily find them and search. It's crazy. You can search by face and whatever. Um, like if you put names by faces, like Shia, Ellie, Riva, then you can just type in a name and it algorithms and identifies the faces kind of creepy but you also know which which kids on actually google thinks looks the same by who they mess up by who they mix up it's also cute anyway long story short i got this morning a video called how they grow up or they grow up so fast or something like that and it's a video collage of videos that i've taken of reva over the years from when she's a little baby like super cute and i saved it blah 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 but it's like it not blah, blah, but okay. So there's nostalgia there. So this is like a nostalgic conversation. Moses tells the elders, right? It will come to pass, right? It's what's going to happen is if your children say to you, what is the service to you? Imagine down the line, right? Think, think, think a hundred years in the future. Imagine your kids a hundred years later are going to ask their parents, why are we doing this lamb business? Right. I just told you that for all generations, you're supposed to do the lamb, the set the Paschal lamb. What if your kids are going to ask you why the lamb? What are you going to say? Do you have an answer? Don't just say, ah, we've been doing it all this time. No, no, no. It's not. You got to give, give them something else. The kids are, the kids are going to ask. The kids are going to question. The kids are going to wonder, why are we doing this? So you shall say, Moses gives the answer. This is like preempting. It's beautiful. Talk about the ultimate educator. Moses. Ah. You got to love Moses. Let's give him a virtual hug, right? You got to love Moses. Moses, the ultimate, the consummate educator is thinking what's going to be when doing this observance for hundreds and hundreds of years, generations and generations of Jews, children are going to be asking their parents, why are we doing this? You got to have a good answer. Here we go. Verse 27. So you shall say, Moses scripts the answer, makes it easy. You shall say it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord. Why? For he passed over. Ah, oh, if you want to see the Hebrew. Zevach Pesach. It's Zevach means a sacrifice. It's a Pesach sacrifice because Pesach, because he passed over. It's a Passover sacrifice because he passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians. Get your story straight. Get your story straight. We were in Egypt. We were slaves. God struck the Egyptians, plague of the firstborn, but he passed over houses when he smote the Egyptians, and he saved our houses. He passed over us. And the people kneeled and prostrated themselves. Hearing this, this is, this is hearing Moses' words. This is not the dialogue that you're supposed to have with your kids, right? This, this, is, this is the dialogue. The dialogue is, the answer is right here in the highlighted text. When your kids say, why are we doing this? And you know what it really means? Kids are around the Seder or friends around the Seder or you're at your own Seder and you're wondering, what are we doing? We have to remember the story. The story is we were slaves. God took us out. I'm giving you the, the, the Cliff Notes version of the story. It's like the short. The point is you got to have your narrative. You got to have your narrative because expect the question. Hearing all of this, Moses, all these instructions, this is, it's happening. We're leaving. This is the final meal. Get your lamb ready. Get your sheep ready. This is how you prepare. This is what you're going to do. This is, you're going to do this for all time. When you get into Israel, I mean, Israel, it's such a dream for that generation. Um, uh, here's how to answer your kids in the future. Hearing all of this, the people kneeled and prostrated themselves. They just bowed down with gratitude, just humble gratitude. So the children of Israel went and did. They got their animals ready. As the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so, so they did. Let's see if there's a Rashi on this last verse. Yeah. <laughs> Rashi says, they went and did. Now, did they already do it? I mean, they went and did. They brought the sacrifice? What do you mean? Wasn't this said to them on Rosh Chodesh in the first of the month? They had another... 10 days to get the animal, another four days after to sacrifice the animal. So what were they doing? Since they accepted upon themselves to do it, scripture credits them as if they had already done it. That's what the measure says. The children of Israel went and did 
It's like they already did it because they were already, they were so gung-ho about it. All right, that's all I want to share today. It, it, I love this story, as you can tell. I'm a fan. What, what am I going to say? I'm a fan of the story. Um, what's the moral of the story? Strive. Don't compromise. Don't, don't sell your potential short. It's a loving message from God to Moses and by putting in the Torah for all of us every single day. Let's strive for something great. We all had, you know, at some point in our lives, we all had a list of dreams. Like, oh, it would be amazing to do this. So what happened to that list? What happened? Did we tell ourselves that we can't do it? Did someone else tell us we can't do it? Let's reject those other narratives and embrace the dream. We may not get, we may not reach it in totality, but let's embrace the dream and strive. Why, why would I even say that? I'm editing myself. Why would I like, let's strive and, and let's accomplish our dreams. Let's not let ourselves talk us out of our ambitions. I mean, holy, healthy ambitions, not like, you know, world domination. Um, Nissan, fire, that's the theme. And finally, from the new reading today, what's the message from the new reading today? The message is, hey, how's it going? We have a special guest. DVP. Hey. <laughs> I think we're um, using her office. Have we absconded no, with her is, office? A, no, Thank this, you for letting us use your office. <laughs> <laughs> this is another office. Um, but the printer is not working. Okay, no, we're just wrapping up. And the lesson from, from today's reading, what's the lesson from today's reading? We read about the Paschal Lamb and about um, let's see what we read about. I think went and did is, is important. Yeah, good. I like that also. Went and did. Because it's, he told the elders, but the people had to be involved. They had to participate and own it and be part of the process. Good. I like that. I like that. They had, they had to have buy-in, but not only buy-in, like where they, they took ownership over it. And they were so excited. They were so enthused at this point. They've come a long way from when the Torah says they couldn't even listen to Moses because of their shortness of breath and the and the and the stress of the work. Now they're they're feeling it. And you're right. They bought in, they took ownership over it, they did it, or they went to do it, or they were committed to do it so much that it's like they already did it even before they did it. And they were ready. They were ready at that point. All right, good. Well, we're setting the stage. Talk about setting the stage. Tomorrow is Friday. We're going to do the last two readings. And um, tomorrow, as we begin tomorrow's reading, I'm just taking a quick look. Uh, yeah, it came to pass at midnight. The Lord smote every firstborn. So it begins immediately tomorrow with um, Plague of the Firstborn. All right, so stay tuned for more DPP tomorrow. Great to see everybody. Uh, don't forget, we have a lot of just really incredible things happening. Um, already next week, this is, we're going bananas with the stuff. We have two programs Monday. I mean, in addition to the normal stuff, couple on coffee, whatever. I'm not, and I'm trying to downplay that, but in addition to the regular stuff, we have Rosh Chodesh Society with the first time we've ever done this, a brachas party, brachot party, which is having a tremendous array of different food items with different blessings and having a chance to taste and recite different blessings and different items. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful um, uh, ceremony and celebration. It, it coupled with a discussion about gratitude and about thankfulness. So that's all coming up. That's all coming up on Monday night, in addition to Think Like a Hasidic Master with Mrs. Nomi Freeman. So there's a lot of lo big things happening Monday. And then Tuesday night is the huge event with Rabbi Label Wolf, the live virtual event. Definitely don't miss that. It includes meditation. And um, I think that is it for that week. And the following week, you have the tree planting, two weeks tree planting up in Hammond Park. We have um, the concert. We have the concert. What else do we have? I feel like I'm missing something. Whatever. Then we have JLI, Shabbat dinner. 
all in good health. All right. It's great to see everybody. Don't forget to sign up for all of the above. If you've already signed up, then take it upon your mission to introduce someone else to it that might enjoy it. There's enough of a variety of things that somebody would thank you to, uh, to know about it. So, so uh, share the love. All right. We'll see you all. Have a wonderful day. Catch you tomorrow. Take care. Thank Bye, you. Everybody.